Welcome to the MPTEL lecture series on quantum computing. I am Ramakrishna from IBM Research and I will be delivering lectures this week along with Professor Pravam Adhyam of IIT Madras. This week's lessons are divided into four modules where you will learn the basics of quantum computing and we will discuss ideas from quantum mechanics and mathematics that are foundational to understanding the subject. The lessons you learned this week will also lay the basis for lessons you will learn in subsequent weeks where you will learn how to develop quantum algorithms and program on real quantum computers. In the first module, you will learn what the basic units of uh, quantum computing are, namely quantum bits or qubits. But first, we will briefly discuss uh, why quantum computing promises to be a game changer in the field of computing and why this is such an exciting subject to study. Next, for those of you who are already familiar with classical computing as uh, programmers, uh, we will briefly compare quantum computing uh, to classical computing concepts. Next, we will provide you a brief background in linear algebra, which is the mathematical foundation that all of quantum computing is based on and presents some brief mathematical notation. The rest of the lecture will be devoted to understanding qubits and uh, their representation both in mathematical and in visual terms. Today's computers can solve a wide variety of problems, but there are certain classes of problems that are too hard even for the most powerful computers that we have today. And this is why we need quantum computing. Now, to understand this a little better, we need to understand how to compare two different problems or two different programs in terms of their hardness. So take a look at this graph. The curves on this graph represent the complexity of a computer algorithm or a uh, computer program. The y-axis represents the time or the space that uh, any program can take and uh, space can be measured in terms of uh, computer memory. The x-axis represents the size of input that we are feeding into a program. So the steeper the curve, the harder that particular problem is or the harder that particular uh, or the longer and more resources that uh, particular computer program will take. So you can see there is certain simple polynomial function spotted here. Uh, there's a linear function which is not very steep at all. Then there's a quadratic function which is very steep. And then there is a function n log n which has a degree somewhere in between 1 and 2. Now let's add a few more functions to this midst. We will add another polynomial function n to the power 5. And then we'll add two exponential functions 2 to the power n and 5 to the power n. You can see these two functions are. At the left of the screen, and they're basically off the charts. They just shoot up immediately for even for very low uh, input sizes. What does this mean? Let us expand the y axis range to take a closer look. You can see now uh, the our quadratic function is slightly less steep, whereas our linear and our n log n functions are almost flat, which means for uh, higher input sizes, uh, uh, the, the time at the memory that uh, is consumed for more complex functions just doesn't compare to uh, simpler functions of linear or quadratic form. Now increasing the y-axis range even further, we see that the our polynomial functions up to n square just cannot be seen at all. They are almost super fast when we look at it. At k. Now our polynomial function has just started to separate from our exponential function, but our exponential functions still rise almost vertically. And here, when we increase the y-axis range even further, there comes a time when uh, any polynomial function will almost be flat. But even the simplest exponential function, like 2 to the power n, still rises up basically steeply. So you can imagine what's happening here. Uh, computer programs that can perform or that take a polynomial amount of time or memory compared to the input sizes, for higher input sizes can perform rather well. But Exponential uh, size uh, programs, that is programs that take an exponential uh, amount of time or an exponential amount of space, just cannot be solved tractably with today's computers. And that's the intuition we're trying to provide with uh, these set of graphs. Now, moving from a linear scale to a log scale graph, you can see the same thing. Uh, the polynomial functions essentially flatten out, whereas the exponential functions uh, rise uh, linearly, which is as expected because it's on log scale. Now let us zoom into the bottom left hand corner of this graph and show you something interesting. You can see here 
the n to the power 5 curve does not always uh, 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 perform better than our exponential curve. At lower values or at lower input sizes, it can actually dominate our exponential curves. First, it can even dominate n to the power 5 or 5 to the power n, and later it can also dominate 2 to the power n for a little longer until it then goes below that curve. What does this mean? This means that uh, at lower input sizes, a polynomial function can actually grow faster than an exponential function. Depends on what the polynomial degree is and depends on what the base of the exponential function is. But what this means is that uh, our uh, classical computers that exist today, which can solve functions uh, or uh, programs that grow uh, polynomially, uh, are still going to be relevant when we have quantum computers. Quantum computers promise to solve problems that are inherently exponential, that is, which have uh, exponential size uh, increase in time or the requirements of space as the input size increase. But for lower input sizes, classical computers may actually end up performing better than quantum computers. So that's a lesson we want to leave you with here. Okay, moving from our motivation, which I hope was sufficient for you to appreciate why we need quantum computing. Let us see how quantum computing compares with the classical computing that many or most of you are already familiar with. In classical computing, as you know, the uh, units of computation are bits or binary digits, 0 and 1. And these represent the states that uh, any uh, computer unit can take. In classical computing, the basic units of computation are binary digits or bits, 0 and 1. And these represent states that any memory unit in a computer can take. In quantum computing, the comparison is with qubits or what are called quantum bits. And these quantum bits can be in states uh, that are loosely equivalent to 0 and 1 that you see at the left. But these are thought of uh, better as unit vectors rather than states, as you will see in the later slides. A qubit can be more than 0 and 1 though. It can be a linear combination of a, a zero state and a one state, as you see at the right. And the coefficients in the uh, in this qubit, alpha zero plus beta one, that is alpha and beta, are complex numbers. And this is called a superposition state. That is, a qubit can be in a superposition of uh, two basis states, zero and one. And again, we will delve into these concepts in detail in subsequent slides. But suffice to say that uh, in classical computing, we only have two states, whereas in, uh, whereas in quantum computing, you can have uh, qubits that are that lie on the continuous scale. And that's what we see here. Uh, a state in uh, or a bit can assume one, only one of two values, 0 or 1, whereas the qubit can assume uh, any value uh, alpha 0 plus beta 1. That alpha and beta are any complex numbers. What does this mean? It means that in classical computing, the state is deterministic. Whereas in quantum computing, uh, a qubit is uh, not a, in a definite state, but rather it has the probability to be either in the zero state or in the one state at any given time. And this probability can actually be measured accurately if we know the coefficients of zero and one, that is alpha and beta. As you can see, that's, uh, for the probability of qubit being in state 0 is mod alpha square and being in state 1 is mod beta square. Again, we will come to these uh, uh, concepts in detail, but suffice to say for now, classical computing uh, states, once you know uh, uh, the state of a bit, it's said that, whereas in quantum computing, a qubit uh, can be an arbitrary value, but what you perceive of a qubit is a 0 or 1 at a given probability. Now let's look at uh, the gates uh, or the computational methods that are used in uh, classical computing versus those used in quantum computing. Uh, if you're familiar with classical computing, you know that uh, we uh, have several kinds of uh, logic gates or uh, what are actually Boolean gates. One example being uh, a NOT gate. Uh, in quantum computing, the equivalent of such a NOT gate is what we would call a poly x gate. Again, a concept we will learn in uh, one of the subsequent, subsequent modules in this lecture. Uh, in classical computing, the computational mechanism or the computational framework used 
to reason about uh, gates and how they convert an input to an output is Boolean algebra. So here, uh, in Boolean algebraic terms, not simply a function that converts 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. In quantum computing, on the other hand, we need to use a more sophisticated uh, mathematical framework, that is linear algebra, and the gates are actually uh, represented by matrices and not simply a uh, Boolean function. So in linear algebraic terms, the poly x gate is actually applying a uh, linear transformation or basically multiplying a uh, our state with a matrix to produce a different state, state being qubits. So in this case, the x gate uh, applied to uh, a zero state or a zero qubit will produce a one qubit, and when it's applied to one qubit, it will produce zero qubit. You can see the equivalent there between classical computing uh, and uh, quantum computing, but the difference is in the internals. The mathematical framework used here is much more sophisticated and complex. Uh, lastly, if you want to uh, use the poly x gate uh, to uh, you apply it to a an arbitrary qubit, alpha zero plus beta one, you end up flipping the coefficients, alpha moves to one and beta moves to zero. Again, we will see how the mathematics of all of this works uh, later in this lecture. Take another example from classical computing, the AND gate. And here is a rough equivalent in quantum computing where you can have a set of qubits or a multi qubit state that uh, uh, to which a quantum gate can be applied and which gives you a multi qubit state as output. Now, in classical computing, you will see that when we uh, take b1, b2 as inputs and we produce b out as an output from the AND gate, this operation is irreversible. Once you get b out, you cannot actually recover b1 and b2 from b out. But in quantum computing, this operation uh, or any such operation is reversible. If we provide a, a multi-qubit multi state q1 up to qn uh, and we feed it to a quantum gate and we get a as output uh, state q1 dash up to qn dash, you can actually recover q1 through qn from q1 dash through qn dash. And this is something that is just not possible in classical computing and uh, whereas it's foundational to quantum computing. So this is one of the big differences. Finally, in classical computing, because our states are definite, that is our bits always lie in uh, definite states, the state space that we can deal with using uh, one or more gates, which is really the foundation of any computer program, is linear in the size of the input. Whereas in quantum computing, because our uh, states are superposition states, we can end up creating uh, from n qubits a state space of size exponential in the uh, in the size of the qubit set. That's 2 to the power n. And that this gives us a lot more computing power. So we can apply with n qubits, we can actually perform operations on state space of exponential size. And again, this you will see in the subsequent lectures in this module, as well as uh, you will see how to do this in uh, practice uh, in quantum algorithms and quantum programming in uh, the next few weeks. Okay, now let's jump into the quantum computing basics having uh, covered all of the comparisons and the motivations. First, we will discuss the mathematical notation that is uh, foundational to understanding uh, how to uh, uh, think about uh, quantum units and how to reason about them and their transformations. So the basic notation you will use here and uh, which you will see is a very convenient way of dealing with uh, quantum states is the Dirac notation or what is also called the bracket notation. The ket is the uh, most basic uh, object that you can get in, uh, in quantum computing. And a ket is, uh, represents a quantum state. And as you will see later, it represents a qubit as well. Roughly, you can think of a ket as being the equivalent of uh, orthogonal unit, unit vectors in a 2D vector space. If you can uh, think of a two-dimensional vector space with the i and j vectors on the x and the y axes, the ket 0 and 1 are roughly equivalent to that uh, and they are also equivalent in uh, linear algebraic terms to column matrices. So in linear algebraic terms, the ket 0 can be represented as a column matrix uh, of uh, two rows, first row being 1, second row being 0 and the ket 1 uh, having the first row 0 and the second row as 1. More generally, any ket can be represented by as the uh, as a linear combination of 
the kets 0 and 1. That's why you see alpha 0 plus beta 1. Uh, again, if you can imagine this in two-dimensional space, you think of it as a uh, an arbitrary vector that you plot on that space, which will be a linear combination of the i and j unit vectors. Except think of the coefficients as being complex numbers. The equivalent of this in a matrix or linear algebraic terms is a column uh, matrix uh, with, uh, 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 with a single element in each row. And this element is actually a, uh, an element in a what is called a complex Hilbert space, which is a vector space. And the this element or this ket, which can be represented as a, uh, a single column two row matrix, is a linear combination of two orthonormal basis states, which is what you see here. Now, what is a Hilbert space? So Hilbert space is really an extrapolation of a two-dimensional space to n dimensions. So if you think of a 2D plane with an x-axis and a y-axis, and you have a unit vector that uh, uh, aligns with the x-axis and a unit vector that aligns with the y-axis, you can represent any point on the 2D space as a linear combination of the unit vectors of the x and the y. Right? A Hilbert space is nothing but uh, an extrapolation of two-dimensional space to n dimensions and the coefficients are uh, complex numbers. So the mathematics remains very similar. It's just that uh, you have a uh, different kind of space. And uh, the standard basis uh, is uh, uh, roughly equivalent to the, your i and j vectors on a 2D space. And these represent what are called orthonormal basis states uh, in linear algebra. That is, they are uh, perpendicular to each other in, in, in a way of speaking. So uh, the bra, which you can see looks like the reversal of a ket is actually an operation or a function that you can apply on any ket. And it's reversed because, as you will see in the next slide, it can be applied to a ket to produce something useful. And uh, for a given ket, we can compute a bra as the conjugate transpose of a ket. What is the conjugate transpose? Just uh, refreshing your uh, complex numbers and matrix uh, theories that you may have learned in high school. Uh, think of a complex number alpha being uh, uh, having a real part A and a, an imaginary part B. Its complex conjugate A star is A minus IB. That is, keep the real part the same and negate the imaginary part. And for a matrix, the conjugate transpose is defined as A dagger. So for a given matrix A, its conjugate transpose A dagger is defined as uh, the uh, complement conjugate, uh, the complex conjugate of that matrix is transpose. So you take the transpose of the matrix A, and then on each element, you apply, uh, you, you change the uh, element to its complex conjugate. That's the conjugate transpose, or uh, A with the dagger symbol uh, at the top right, as you can see. Uh, in matrix terms, if the ket is a column vector, the bra is a row vector, as you can see. So a ket has alpha and beta in the two different rows. Bra has a single row with alpha star, that is the complex conjugate of alpha a beta star complex conjugate of beta in one row. Okay, So this uh, page shows you uh, kets and bras of two dimensions. Now these are the most, these are simplest uh, kinds of kets uh, and bras that you can encounter. Let us generalize the ket and the bra beyond two dimensions. Okay, Take uh, a general ket phi, which is actually a, a, an n by one matrix and a bra phi which is an uh, n by 1 matrix. Okay. Now, there is a, a particular operation we can perform called bra ket, which applies the bra operator to a ket vector. You can see here it's represented uh, with this notation, which is the bra joined to a ket. And this is actually the inner product of uh, the bra and the ket, or rather the is inner product of the vectors uh, vector represented by phi and the vector represented by uh, psi. So think about uh, vector dot products in a two-dimensional uh, vector space. Okay, uh, When you do dot product, you get a scalar, right? Similarly here, the bracket produces a scalar quantity. In this case, it ends up being a single complex number. Take an example from above. Uh, the bra is a 1 by n matrix and the ket is an n by 1 matrix, right? So it is nothing but the multiplication of those two matrices and 
The output here ends up being a one by one matrix, which is nothing but a single quantity, a scalar, or in this case, it's a complex number. Uh, taking some concrete examples, let's uh, apply the browse zero to the get zero. Okay, now the browse zero is simply this row matrix, and we know this is the get zero. If you do the matrix multiplication, you simply get the quantity one. Uh, the bracket of one and zero, on the other hand, it gives us the quantity zero. You can relate this to your to uh, vector spaces, where if you uh, Take the scalar product of two collinear vectors, you end up reinforcing them, right? Whereas if you take the dot product of two orthogonal vectors or perpendicular vectors, uh, the, because their projection onto each other are zero, they end up being zero. Similarly, we can see the intuition behind trying to get here. Uh, this is simply is just called the inner product in uh, linear algebraic or uh, Dirac terms. Now the get bra is the reverse. Uh, Thing to a bracket, and you can see here, and even the notation is reverse. You just have a get followed by a bra. What does this mean? Our bra is an operator, right? The get bra simply changes uh, our uh, one operator into another, and it's called an outer product in contrast to the bracket, which is an inner product. And let's just see what this produces. Uh, our get is an n by one matrix. Our bra is a one by n matrix. If you multiply them, what do you get? You get an n by n matrix, right? And that's what our outer product is. It's an n by n matrix, but then in linear algebraic terms, any matrix is a linear transformation operator, right? So you end up producing a different kind of operator. And you will see this come, uh, kind of operator will come in very handy when we do quantum computation calculation. And uh, having a shorthand of this form, the get bra, instead of this big matrix, can be very useful. So let's go into single qubits now which are the basic units of computation in any uh, quantum computing system. Uh, a single qubit is nothing but a vector in complex two-dimensional Hilbert space, uh, and it can be represented uh, very generally as a, an arbitrary ket, uh, which is a linear combination of our uh, orthonormal basis state 0 and 1, whose inner product is 0, and the coefficients happen to be complex numbers. Uh, the matrix representation of this is uh, Two by one matrix, as you've already seen. Now, uh, our qubits or our quantum states, uh, though generally they can be described as a linear combination of basis states, or in other words, they can be described as a superposition of uh, a zero and a one. When we actually look at those qubits, they probabilistically collapse to either of those two basis states, so they do not remain in the uh, uh, in the superposition form. When you look at them. They collapse so they can assume the form either 0 or 1 and as it happens their probabilities of assuming the form 0 or uh, the form 1 or rather in other terms being in the state 0 or being in the state 1 happens to be definite and we can actually calculate this uh, before we attempt the calculation just uh, a refresher on complex numbers if you take an arbitrary complex number alpha equals a plus ib or Using polar coordinates, it can be expressed as r e to the i theta. Uh, its modulus uh, is nothing but root over a square plus b square, or r if you take the polar coordinate form. So let's look at the probability of our qubit q being in state 0. And that is given by this particular formula. The formula is, look at the internal term. It's the bra 0 applied to the uh, uh, ket q that we have here. And then when we get the... Uh, after we get the bra, uh, compute the bracket, we get a complex number, right? We take the modulus of that and we take the square, okay? Now let's do the math here. So let's expand Q, which is alpha 0 plus beta 1. Now because uh, all, all the operations we are doing here are linear transformation operations, we can uh, distribute as well as take scalar uh, parts of an expression out. And that's what we'll do here. We'll apply the 0 to this term and we'll apply the 0 uh, bra again to this term. What do we get? We can take the alpha out and we get the bra 0 applied to the ket 0 plus we take the beta out and we have the bra 0 applied to the ket 1 and we take the modulus and the square. Now as you have seen the uh, bracket 0 0 is 1 and the bracket 0 1 because they are also normal basis vectors is 0. This term vanishes and all we are left with is alpha. So we get mod alpha square. 
Similarly, the probability of Q being in the state 1 or, the Q, uh, or qubit Q collapsing to the state 1 ends up being mod beta square. And the math here is identical to what we just saw. And uh, as it turns out, mod alpha square plus mod beta square must add up to 1. Why is that? Uh, all, of, all the qubits we are going to be dealing with must have the, uh, if you take the equivalent bra and you apply it to that qubit as a ket, they must end up being 1. And this is called a normalized state. So the, uh, we are only going to be dealing with what are called normalized states or normalized qubits. And the idea of normalization comes from uh, quantum physical requirements. Uh, but you can see why this requirement exists. You have the probability of our qubit collapsing to either the 0 or the 1. It can't collapse to anything else, right? Therefore, the probabilities must add to 1. And uh, note that alpha and beta are also referred to as probability uh, amplitudes for a general qubit. Uh, you'll learn more about the quantum physical requirements and the intuition behind this in the subsequent modules this week, uh, which are delivered by Professor Prabhamandi. Having covered the mathematical representation, let's uh, try a visual representation of a qubit. Okay? And the tool we can use for this is called a block sphere. This sphere is simply, it's, it's any general sphere with a, an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis. And note that uh, our z-axis has at its extremities, or the north and south pole, our standard basis vectors 0 and 1 respectively. Okay, And we'll come to that in the next slide. Take any arbitrary qubit, q, which is alpha 0 plus beta 1. Turns out we can use a block sphere to represent this qubit q in a, a visually intuitive way. Any qubit Q can be represented as a uh, point on the surface of the block sphere. Okay. So let's see uh, what more uh, Qs we can get out of block sphere representation. Uh, the moduli uh, or the probability amplitudes alpha and beta can be represented using uh, polar coordinates, right? So let's uh, assume alpha is r1 e to the power i theta 1, beta is r2 e to the power i theta 2, and because Q is a normalized uh, qubit. Uh, R1 square plus R2 square must add to 1, as we saw in the, a couple of slides before. Note that this expression is independent of both theta1 and theta2, which, and we'll come to theta1 and theta2 later. Uh, but in this particular expression, note that uh, we can use, uh, uh, represent R1 and R2 in terms of uh, trigonometric functions. So, because the square of a cos of an angle plus the square of that angle sine must add to 1, we can assume R is the cause of a particular angle, let's pick theta by 2, and R2 then must be the sine of the same angle, theta by 2. And this adds to 1 for any value theta. Why do we choose theta by 2 and not uh, theta? As it turns out, it's because then we can represent any arbitrary qubit Q uh, with uh, an angle theta to the z axis and orient it towards the north pole. Okay? Let's uh, understand this a little bit more. If let's assume theta to be zero, so what do we get? Uh, cos zero is one, right? So r one must be one. Sine zero is zero, so r two must be zero. And if theta is zero, that means uh, this is one and this is zero. Or q becomes simply state zero, and that is why you see the vector zero or the ket zero at the north pole or at this extreme end of the z-axis. Similarly. If we take uh, theta to be uh, pi, then cos theta cos pi by 2 is 0. R1 becomes 0. So this term cancels out. And uh, sine pi by 2 is uh, 1, right? Or sine 90 degrees, that's 1. So beta becomes 1. So we get q uh, becoming vector 1. And so if theta is pi or 90 degrees, our qubit q is nothing but the vector 1. And hence, we have our z axis. Uh, at its extremities with the 0 and the 1 gets. Hope that's uh, understandable to you. Uh, also note that our uh, representation, the block sphere, end up doubling the angle uh, between qubits and the basis vectors as you would see in the Hilbert space. right? So in a Hilbert space, and for intuition just assume a two-dimensional space, our basis vectors 0 and 1 or i and j unit vectors would be perpendicular to each other. right? But here our basis vectors 0 and 1 are uh, have an angle of pi with each other, which is double. So, so that's another intuition you can take. That's why uh, our though the mathematical representation has a theta by 2, in visually 
the term theta is uh, what matters uh, when you look at uh, the angle to which, with, between the uh, qubit and the z axis. Now let's uh, consider our argument spot or the complex spot. So we have theta 1 here and you have theta 2 here, right? Associated with alpha and beta respectively. Without lots of generality, we can assume theta 2 equals theta 1 plus some angle phi. Okay. And note that only this relative phase phi matters because uh, whatever uh, be theta 1 and theta 2, we just uh, we, we can have this expression and uh, they will have some difference with each other, right? So, if we set in this uh, expression, let's just set theta 1 to be 0, then theta 2 simply becomes phi or the difference between theta 2 and theta 1. And if we do that, then our original expression changes to cos theta by 2 phi uh, 0 plus e to the power i phi sin theta by 2 1. Okay. Now, we have uh, no more complex part associated with 0 and we only have the complex part associated with 1. And if you look at the uh, rock sphere here, this angle phi, if you take this expression, ends up being the angle uh, between our uh, qubit q or the vector q and the x-axis. So you can look at the projection of q onto the xy plane and then the angle with the x-axis is going to be nothing but phi. Now, uh, how can we just set theta 1 to be 0 and therefore just use phi rather than having uh, two separate values for theta 1 theta 2? Think about uh, our sphere, right? This is sphere. We can have the sphere in any uh, frame of reference or at uh, in any uh, uh, rotated position. So as long as uh, we uh, put in a position where we assume that uh, the uh, one of the thetas can be zero, then the, our uh, vectors can be represented using simply the difference between the thetas. So we have the freedom to rotate our sphere in any way possible. And that really is the intuition behind behind this, uh, or behind just using the uh, relative phase rather than the absolute uh, phase, because we are not forced to have our sphere in any particular ori orientation. The sphere is our entire space, and we can choose to put it in any position so that we can deal only with the difference between the uh, phases of uh, of the two parts of Q. Uh, now, this is this uh, qubit relative phase or the rotation. In other words, around the z axis, okay? the angle is with the x axis, but really, the you think about it, the relative phase means how much a qubit has rotated around the z axis. This also has no analog in classical computing, just like the concept of superposition. So, that's another big difference you should note between uh, quantum and classical computing. Uh, you'll learn more about the physical intuitions as well as some more intuition about uh, basis states as well as phases in the subsequent modules delivered by Dr. Prabhamandiam. But uh, for now, just keep in mind that uh, we can represent uh, uh, any uh, arbitrary qubit on a block sphere using simply two angles, theta and phi. Uh, let's take some notable examples of single qubits before we close out this module. So if you look at the block sphere, our vector 0 or our get 0 is uh, at one end of the z axis. And we have already seen can be represented by a uh, 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 a single or a single column vector. Similarly, the uh, uh, qubit 1 is at the other uh, extremity of the z axis. Uh, another special vector is uh, at uh, one end of the x axis, and that we call as a plus vector, and that is the superposition of 0 and 1, and uh, uh, our alphas and betas here are both 1 by root 2. Okay. In matrix terms, this can be represented as this, 1 by root 2 and 1 by root 2. And note that if you take the square of the uh, probability uh, of the moduli and add them, you'll get half plus half and 1. So therefore, you get you can see that the plus state is a normalized vector. Similarly, our minus state uh, lies at the other end of the x-axis. And uh, you, it's similar to plus except that the sign on the 1 is a negative. Uh, at the, both the ends of the y-axis, we have what we call the plus i vectors and the minus i vectors. Okay, and this is also plus i is very similar to plus, except that uh, you have an i associated with with one. Now note that when you take the uh, moduli of zero and one, you square them, add them, 
the imaginary part uh, uh, plays no role so you can have you can do a, uh, a half uh, add it to a half and you get a one right so that that tells you that these uh, the plus i vector and the minus i vector are also normalized so this concludes our first module and let's just summarize what you learned and what you're going to learn in the next uh, few modules that's why you've learned about the key differences between quantum and classical computing and you've learned about qubits the linear algebraic concepts that underlie them and their visual representations using the block sphere next you will learn about the quantum physical basis of qubits you will learn more mathematical details about quantum states as well as the basis states that uh, they are linear combinations of and you will see how to measure quantum superposition states okay we uh, alluded to this when we talked about how a qubit collapses to a zero or one state uh, you will find out what uh, the notion of uh, quantum state measurement is and how we can measure quantum state. See you next module.